there are some people, but there are not people that touched so many different lives like Lefty. Um, he's he. There will never be another one of him. You know, he encouraged people to share their knowledge and not hold on to it and not have egos and have fun. You know, his one of the things he told me one time was, you know, the fishing is great and it's exciting to catch fish and. You remember those things, but you remember the conversations you had with the guys on the boat or at the side of the stream. That was Gary Rich describing one of the reasons that Lefty was so special to so many in fly fishing. There's only one Lefty today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Good chance, uh, make sure to click the subscribe button uh, in your app of choice if you're new and haven't uh, subscribed to the podcast. That would be super helpful. And make sure that uh, you get the next episode delivered directly to your inbox. Gary Rich is here to share some uh, of the stories in the background on Lefty Cray. Lefty uh, died just a few months after this podcast launched um, back in 2017. And at the time, I didn't have much of a connection to Lefty, uh, but since then, I've heard so many amazing stories. I wanted to celebrate his life of fly fishing and, and our 200th episode all in one big blast. So I'm hoping uh, if you don't know the, all the Lefty stories or, or some of them, you enjoy the episode today. Uh, we find out a few of those stories. I find out about uh, who the most influential person was to Lefty way back when he first started in fly fishing. Uh, what the lefty grunt is all about and uh and we got so many other great stories that i'm gonna uh, sprinkle in today so hope you enjoy the show before we get started let's hear from our sponsors turtle box is a new company i've been working with this year they build an amazing portable speaker that is louder and more rugged than anything i've ever encountered unlike most other portable speakers out there the turtle box was specifically built with the sportsman in mind the quality of this speaker is truly unreal. I've talked with the guys at Turtle Box, solid dudes by the way. They love the outdoors and are all avid sportsmen. This is a product I can truly say does not disappoint. Go ahead and check the guys out at turtleboxaudio.com. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that are second to none in quality and can be customized for that little extra touch. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. Uh, so without further ado, here is Gary Rich, a friend and student of Lefty Cray. How's it going, Gary? Going really good, Dave. How are you today? Good. Thanks for taking the time to put this together. I'm uh, really excited. Uh, we've got a, uh, well, officially it's going to be our 200th episode. We've done a bunch of bonus episodes and things like that over the years. So we're well over 200 now, but um, I've got this lefty cray. I'm trying to do a celebration for, to celebrate this podcast for 200 and also celebrate one of the most influential, you know, one of the people out there you probably hear more about than anybody. And, and you wrote an article about lefty in Angler's Journal. I wanted to to talk about that but before we get there just can you talk about uh, i'm not even sure if, if you do any fly fishing or fishing and then um and how you got into angler's journal yeah i do so i was one of those people that kind of got bit by the river runs through it bug in the mid 90s and went out and you know within a couple days of uh of that movie i, I went and uh picked up a fly rod and didn't know what I was doing and kind of started casting around the bay here. And, and the, you know, ignorance is bliss. I think when you're getting started in fly fishing, I think you're willing to, to do things that most people wouldn't do because you don't know any better. So, you know, I started poking around some of the trout streams around here and, um, you know, doing some pond fishing. And then, uh, you know, I started reading about, uh, saltwater fly fishing and, you know, the albacore runoff of Cape Lookout. And I was like, I got to do that. So, you know, I, that's when I got into saltwater fly fishing, which is probably the majority of what I do now. Um, you know, we've got striped bass here in the Bay. Um, some years are better than others. And, and, uh, but I always spend a, a week down at Cape Lookout, Harker's Island area for the uh, false albacore and red drum run in the fall. That's kind of my, you know, if I don't have any other time to go out and uh, get some fly fishing in, I'm going to do that 
you know, before I cancel anything else, that's my one time ago and I'm definitely going to fish during the year. So, um, I don't fish as much as I, I like to, but it's, uh, um, I do get out and anglers is, uh, you know, when I had the opportunity to start freelancing for them, it was, you know, I saw this thick, really kind of, uh, gray's journal looking, you know, magazine with really heavy paper and gorgeous photography. And I remember at the time, you know, I was a freelancer and I said, I want to write for these guys. So I, you know, started bothering, uh, our editor in chief, Bill Sisson and, and bugging him a little bit. And I got a couple little of assignments and then, uh, you know, kind of got into, uh, our organization, which is a group of different marine publications, and you know, eventually um, kind of work my way into the managing editor position at Anglers. Um, so oh, wow. do a lot of write, do a lot of writing for them, and and just you know the behind the scenes stuff that's required to put a magazine together. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and and I and I obviously, I mean, I think probably a lot of people have heard of Anglers Journal. Can you just you know maybe just somebody new, just on Anglers Journal? Could you describe that magazine just quickly, like you know, for somebody who has never read it? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, our kind of reason for being is producing a magazine that, you know, anybody can go out and pick up a a magazine with, you know, how to's and tutorials and, and, you know, how to tie this knot, how to fish for this fish. We don't really do any of that. Um, all of our, um, stuff for the, the, you know, the large part is our stories, you know, anecdotes from people who have traveled to, you know, Jurassic Lake down in um, South America or, you know, Fly Fish Christmas Island or like the stuff that I do. I like to do profiles. So, you know, I did a profile on Lefty Mm -hmm. and I did a profile on Meredith McCord, who's a world record holder. And and so we do people and then we do these kind of niche little things like, you know, who knew about the, you know, smelt fishing that they do up in Maine in the middle of the winter? I sure didn't until I pick up an, you know, an angler's journal. And, you know, there are these unique um, uh, tackle shops that we do stories on. So I guess the best way to describe it is it's not kind of, you know, your ordinary newsstand magazine. It's it's really deep in its reporting. Um, and we focus a lot on people and artwork and photography and kind of trying to take people and put them into these places and in a chair next to the people that we're profiling. So you, you're not going to find any, you know, how to, how to drift for flounder or, or anything like that. These are kind of long form features that are, are, are deep in nature and take a lot of effort to put together. Gotcha. And and when you say it anglers, is it, is it mainly, um, is it more focused on fly fishing or all fishing? All fishing. Um, you know, it, it's just, it can be as simple as, you know, um, we had a really nice piece in our last summer issue about a, a guy who takes his son uh, fishing for smallmouth with bobbers and worms. But the way he described the story and the way he put people in the place was really great. We do have a lot of fly fishing. We do cover a lot of fly fishing stuff. I'd say it's probably 50, 60 percent fly fishing and 40 percent. Yep. Um, the other stuff, spin casting, light tackle, things of that sort. And then there's the stuff that's, you know, just related. We just did a story about this, uh, uh, woman, uh, out in Oregon named, uh, I think her name is Vela and she's, uh, uh, a fillet queen is what they call her. (laughs) And she, you know, she was a really interesting profile because she sits there in the, in her grundins all day and slices up all the, 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 the head boat, um, catches. Oh yeah. Um, so it's, it's really varied when we can find something that's unique like that or a person that's unique. Um, we're always, we're always game to include it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That, that gives us a little intro and, and obviously today we're going to uh, dig into lefty because you wrote a really good, uh, you know, that profile, uh, article you wrote was, uh, pretty, you know, pretty in depth, a lot of, uh, great photos of lefty and, um, you know, and like I said, he's, I've probably heard more about Lefty. I never met him. I never interviewed him. But since, you know, I think I started this podcast actually just a couple months before he passed away. And uh, but I'm I've learned now over the years like the impact from Lefty. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of wanted to start, you know, thinking about Lefty. I know you have that article. I'll put a link in the show notes so people can read that because we won't cover everything today. But you know, what do you think? I mean, if you just start off, if, as far as Lefty, what 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 should somebody who remember about lefty like what are the some of the things that that stick out to you from doing the the research i met lefty because i was a fanboy and i had read his books and just absorbed everyone that that i um Hmm. uh, you know came across and 
when I found out that he lived a half an hour north of me, I was like, I got to find this guy and I got to talk to him. And, you know, my experience with people of notoriety in your reporting and journalism can be that they're really difficult to get hold of. They don't want to talk to anybody. Um, So I managed to to trick one of my friends into giving me his phone number. (laughs) And I called him at his house and I said, hey, Lefty, you know, I'm I'm a young writer. I, I, you know, I've read all your books. I, you know, your inspiration, the whole thing. And I said, I'd really like to come up to your house and get some fly fishing lessons. I hear that you give fly fishing lessons. And he said, yep, absolutely. No problem. We go, we picked a date, you know, I forget what it was a ridiculously little tiny amount of money. I think it was 135 bucks or something like that. So, you know, I go up to his house and, um, you know, this, kind of shortish guy comes up to me and and the thing that has always struck me about lefty is he makes you feel like you're the only person in the room so whether you're at his house or whether you're at a show if you approach him and you're here to talk to him he'll make you feel within 30 seconds you know or he would make you feel like in 30 seconds that you know you mattered and that he was going to you know give you his attention. And sometimes he almost did it to his detriment. You know, he would have these people following him around the, the fly fishing shows. Um, but you know, if, if you, it's, it's almost, it's really difficult to describe all the influences that he had. But I think the biggest thing about lefty was his generosity, his, uh, being so genuine and so giving to the community. Um, there are just so many things about him that are absolutely remarkable that, you know, you can't, uh, I could talk about him for six hours and not cover everything. Yeah. And I only knew him for, you know, about 10 years, 10, maybe fit 12 years uh-huh. or so. Um, but you know, he took me to, to, to lunch, you know, that day we went and, um, you know, we went to his house and we're sitting in his office and I'm sitting here with my mouth agape that I'm sitting next to this guy, you know, and he doesn't he doesn't think it's a big deal. And he had a you know, a, he was having computer problems. And I used to actually work at an Apple store and I helped him with his computer. We fixed a problem. I left <clears throat> three days later. I get this handwritten note on his stationery. Gary, thank you so much for helping with my, my computer. You're not going to be do it, do this for free for free, but I would love it if you come up to my house every now and then work on my computer and I'll give you casting huh. listings. So that's where, that's where our friendship began. And it, so can you imagine going to some stranger's house, especially somebody of notoriety and then becoming friends with them in two days? It's right. that's le- that's lefty. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. That's some of the stuff you, you hear. And another thing you hear a lot of people say is that, you know, just from talking to him for even like 10 minutes, people will come up. I think Flip Pallet was saying this on a, on a video out there, but um, you know, the people will say, yeah, Lefty was my mentor, you know, like instantly, you know, the people, everybody felt like, you know, he was just a friend. And so that's obviously pretty amazing. Um, Yeah. Maybe you could take us back with Lefty. Just take us back uh, if you can to, do you know the whole story, like how he got into fly fishing initially and all that stuff? I do. So um, Lefty, came from very humble beginnings. He was born in Frederick, uh, Maryland, grew up in Frederick, Maryland, but his father was killed in a sort of freak basketball accident. You know, somebody kicked a basketball or threw a basketball and it, it basically bruised his heart to an extent that it killed him. So I think at age 12, Lefty was, you know, the man of the house and was responsible for putting food on the table um, his, you know, he had, I think t- two brothers or brother and, no, he had a brother and sister or two brothers, mm-hmm. but anyway, he was the oldest in the house. So it was his job to earn money and put food on the table. And, you know, he was, the story he always told was, you know, we were on welfare, but welfare back then wasn't like it is now, you know, like we lived in this house, they paid our rent. We never saw a penny. They delivered coal and shoved it in the basement and every now and then I'd have to go to this place in town with a wheelbarrow and pick up these bags and boxes that were labeled with relief. So he couldn't even go to school, Dave, His, you know, because hmm. they couldn't afford school clothes. So Lefty started hunting and trapping, you know, on the Monocacy River near where he lived. And there were catfish in there. 
And, you know, I think I remember him one time telling me he paid, they paid him, you know, 10 cents a pound for dressed catfish. So at night he would go out and, uh, you know, one of, one of his, his little one liners he always gave me was, you know, Oh, we were, we were fishing for these catfish and they love these muscles. And he goes, as soon as you put the line in the water, it was like rolling a wine bottle through a jail cell. <laughs> you know, and we caught all of these, all these, you know, catfish and, you know, I was trapping for, um, muskrat. So he put himself through high school, um, by trapping and hunting. And of course he, he became to come, you know, more adept at doing these things. And he, you know, even the boy scouts, you know, in the boy scouts, you had to pay for trips, you had to pay for your uniforms and they had no money. So lefty cut a deal with him and said, Hey, look, I'll wash dishes and clean up after meetings and after, you know, camp outs and things of that sort. And they let him, you know, be a scout. So, I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that is. You know, this is a, this is a 12 to 14 year old uh, kid who has to almost instantly become a man. And, but he doesn't, he never complained about it anyway. So Hmm. eventually, you know, he finished high school and at two weeks after he got out of high school, he got a draft notice. And, um, he was in the army and, uh, you know, over world war two and he was in, uh, you know, some fairly large, significant historically as well as just matter of fact battles. One was battle of the bulge. Mm. Um, and he, you know, was among the first U S troops to greet the, um, um, the Russians, the red army at the Elba river, um, and, you know, that war ended and he came home to Frederick and he thought, you know, they're immediately going to ship me off to Japan. Yep. So he's kind of, you know, hanging out for a couple of weeks, figuring out what's going to happen. And then Japan surrendered. And that was the end. That was the end of his military career. So from there, he, he you know, knew he needed to find a job and he needed to, to do something. So he was hunting and trapping um, and doing things of that sort. And um Farther down the road a little bit, um, he met up with a guy named uh, Joe Brooks, yep. <clears throat> who everybody on this podcast is probably going to know who <laughs> Joe Brooks is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Joe took him, took Lefty under his wing. And there was a, you know, there, there was another guy, uh, and I'm not sure of his name, but I think he worked at the Frederick News Post. And, you know, he heard about Lefty and how good Lefty, you know, what a fisherman he was and, and all of this and said, I'd like you to write an outdoors column. And, and Lefty was like, I can't write. I, you know, I barely graduated high school. I haven't been to college. And the guy was like, that's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll, te- I'll, I'll help you with the writing. I, but I want this content from you and I want you to tell us some fishing stories and, and, and help. That's how people got information back then was in the outdoor columns in the newspaper, you know. Yeah. So at that point, you know, he's, he's writing some articles, um, and, um, you know, fly, he hadn't started fly fishing yet. Um, he met up with Joe Brooks one day and they went to, uh, I'm not sure exactly where it was on the Potomac river, but, you know, lefty got out his spinning outfit and started casting and Brooks got out this bamboo fly rod, which lefty had never really seen. <laughs> And started casting it and started catching smallmouth on every cast. And I'll never forget what Lefty told me. He said, he said, Gary, I saw that. And I was like, good God, I got to have some of that. <laughs> so <laughs> he, uh, he, the next day, he went down to Tockerman's Tackle in Baltimore, which is still in business wow. and, and, and still there. Bought a nine weight uh, rod. I think it was a, a Fluger Metalist reel, which probably every one of us has had. Yep. Um, and that, you know, that's where it started, you know, the line, the fly lines back then were silk lines and, you know, he ended up becoming quite good at it and, and, you know, Brooks helped him along. Um, and he, he just began to develop and develop and writing more articles. And eventually these, these fly fishing groups or fishing groups would say, Hey, will you come and give us, give a talk, you know, at our, walleye club in michigan and he'd be like yeah you you know you're gonna need to pay to fly me there pay for my uh you know my motel room so he would give a talk and inevitably he would arrange a fishing trip with a couple guys from these clubs and he was handy with a camera and that's when he that's when his writing career really started to take off and uh so he would he would go 
give a talk, the next day go fishing, and then come home and write about it. Hmm. So that's how he started making a living doing what he ended up doing pretty much for the rest of his life. Um, and he figured out pretty quickly that if he could supply photographs with his articles, that he would be more desirable and sought after by publications. And it's something he taught me early on when I was doing freelancing. I'm like, lefty, these, you know, these people are not getting back to me. And he says, you need to take pictures and include pictures with your article. So that, that he said, an editor will love that. Um, anyway, that's a little bit off the subject, but, yeah, that's um, amazing. that's kind of how, that's kind of how he, he got going and, and, you know, probably his biggest claim to fame was, was how good a fly caster he was. And he, and he would give these talks and he would do what he would call showboating. You know, he would, uh, take a, you know, a line and flick a cigarette out of somebody's mouth at 20 <laughs> yards or something like that. Um, and I remember seeing some pictures on his computer of him dressed up in a, in a full suit with a sport jacket, you know, with a fly rod in a, in a bas- you know, gymnasium in a high school. And, uh, you know, he told me, he said, yeah, I don't, I, I got to the point where I didn't like doing that. You know, he goes, I didn't like being a show off guy. And I, you know, that's when he started deciding that I want to teach people how to do this. I don't, I don't want to show off anymore. So that's, when he really started working on this kind of alternative casting style that he became famous for, you know, I think anybody younger than 40 years of, or older than 40 years of age, you know, who learned how to fly fish, you know, the first book they picked up or the first person they talked to, you know, told them about 10 and two mm-hmm. and, you know, moving the, moving stiffly, moving the rod back and forth. And that's completely not the way lefty casted, you know, he, his movement was, was, there was zero wasted energy, but anyway, he started teaching this to people. He, he, he would, you know, and the way he taught was amazing. He would, I'll never forget my first lesson with him. You know, he came up behind me, he grabbed my arm, he put his left hand, you know, hand on my left shoulder and, and really worked with me to show me the movement. And, you know, of course he, he always had these jokes, you know, like, and I think everybody who's had a cast casting lesson or seen a demonstration by lefty, you know, he had this line, Hey, have you ever taken a look at your back cast? And the answer is always no. <laughs> and he'd always say, good, because it's ugly as hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, he just had this, you know, this, he was just a born teacher, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's kind, of, that's kind of the early part of, of Lefty. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been a huge net guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y to get started right now. Okay, back to the show. There were some other interesting things about him. You know, when he actually had a, a, a full-time job, it was shift work. He worked at uh, Fort Detrick, which is where they made anthrax. Wow. Um, you know, weapons-grade anthrax. And it's just, this is just another one of those incredible things about this this guy's life. And, you know, they he described how they would have these vats and they would make these, you know, hundred gallon tubs of anthrax mud that he called it. And, you know, they're in these biological suits and, you know, his job was basically to scrape these, these tubs clean and then, you know, give the, the resultant product to the scientists to work with. 
Well, one morning he woke up and his, his right, his, all of his right arm was completely black. Oh. And he's like, crap, I've got anthrax. Jeez. So he was in the hospital for, I think he told me three weeks or so. And they took cultures of the bacteria in his blood. And there is actually a strain of anthrax called BVK1. Now, that doesn't mean anything to most people, but Lefty's real name is Bernard Victor Cray. So that anthrax virus, BVK1, was named after the cultures they take, took from the blood running through his body. Oh, wow. Was, you know, through the infection. But he got over it. Huh. Um, and that was, I think, probably around the, the late, um, either early or, or, or mid-50s or so. Yeah. Uh, and that's also when he met his, his wife, um, Evelyn, or soon, you know, what, who would become his wife. Um, and Evelyn, Evelyn was lefty's rock. And that's just a really cliche, cliche way to put it. But every time he talked about Evelyn, he would say, you know, I, we had the best marriage of anybody I know. But the way he met her was he and a bunch of his buddies went to the uh, it was called the Trivoli or Tivoli Theater in Frederick. And she was a you know ticket person there. And she purposely gave him a child's ticket. So he didn't pay any attention. She handed out three or four tickets to Lefty and, and his friends. But when Lefty you know, got to the ticket taker, he's like, this is a kid's ticket. You're, you're not a kid. So he went back to the, the you know the ticket counter and you know he uh, he said you know she had done that on purpose <laughs> because she wanted to talk to him and uh, so you know they he, I think that night he went and saw the movie and then he walked her home and they you know talked on the porch for for an hour or so and then it kind of went from there and I remember you know Lefty saying you know. Uh, Six months later, we were engaged, and uh, you know, a year later, we were married. And he winked at me when he was telling me about this, and he <laughs> said, nine months after that, our daughter Vicky <laughs> was born." Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if this is safe for publishing, but he, yeah, yeah. he said, he said, back then you didn't get any nookie if you weren't married, Gary. So we got <laughs> got to getting married pretty quick. There you go. And the funny thing is, is when he would say things like that, that some people would consider not safe for work or whatever, he did it in such a way that was so innocent. And so funny that it, it wasn't offensive. You know, he was just such a his, his personality was just amazing. So anyway, they, you know, fell in love. They they had uh, his daughter, um, Vicky, first. And he told me that the reason there's a three or four year gap between um, you know Vicky and his son, Larry, is because uh, Vicky was a horrible child early on. And he's like. I don't know if I, he, he told me, he said, I told my wife, I don't know if I want to do another one of these, <laughs> but eventually they, you know, they had Larry and later in life, Larry would come over and uh, cook lefty dinner uh, every night after uh, Evelyn passed away. Evelyn, uh, uh, she had a, a stroke, I think in 2009 or so, and oh. then she passed away in, in 2011. Gotcha. In 2011. Um, yeah. But, uh, and I think lefty told me the, the single biggest, um, advancement in his life came when Joe Brooks asked him to run the, uh, Miami Metro, um, fishing tournament, um, which at the time was the biggest fishing tournament in the world. And I remember him saying, you know, being the, the head of that tournament was like being the mayor of South Florida fishing. And it was around that time when, you know, these innovations were, were, you know, being born for saltwater fly fishing. And I remember him telling me one time, he goes, you know, uh, w without that tournament, without me being down there and without people doing the things that they were doing, you know, there would never really would have been any saltwater fly fishing. Yeah. But he never did it in a braggy way. You know, one of the, the neatest things about him is he did not like bragging and he did not like people that bragged. And, you know, I remember at uh, fly fishing shows, if somebody came up and said, oh, I can do this and I can do that, lefty would walk away. You know, he'd, he'd just say, you know, thank you very much and move on. But if you were, if you came to him seeking knowledge or, um, you know, wanting to know something or just to say hi to him, he'd give you all the time in the world. Yeah. Um, anyway, getting back to the, to the subject, you know, he ran that tournament um, 
and in the process, you know, met Flip Pallet, uh, Stu Apt, um, Billy Pate. Um, you know, he, he told me a story about meeting uh, Ted Williams. Hmm. And, you know, he was like, you know, Ted Williams was an honorary son of a bitch. Hmm. He goes, I didn't like him. Um, he was as tough as a rubber tire. He says, I just, I didn't like him. And, and he eventually went and, you know, gave Ted some casting lessons and then they became best friends pretty much. Huh. Um, so he, you know, that was the beginning of, I don't want to say his celebrity status, but that's when he, you know, he started kind of, you know, meeting up with these people that are, you know, uh, I don't know how to put it They're You know, yeah. they're, they they're, have notoriety like him and, uh, and, you know, there's a few, yeah, over the years, a bunch. I mean, what, what year was that when um, he, well, what, what year was it when he actually quit for, uh, you know, his kind of the day job sort of stuff? I want to say that's probably around the, the mid fifties, late fifties. Yeah. So, so basically, yeah, mid to late fifties. So he's, and then he's kind of all in, uh, still writing, I guess he's always written, um, and then what do you, I mean, what elevate was that the thing that tournament, the Miami Metro, that thing kind of elevated him, uh, to kind of that next level. Yeah. And actually it was, uh, I just found the date, Dave, it's 1964, um, when he started that tournament and, and he said that, you know, I remember him telling me it was a big deal cause he had to uproot all his, his, his family, his, you know, his two kids and his wife and take him down there. So it was a big deal. Um, and you were asking a question and I kind of lost track. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I was kind of just trying to get a feel for, you know, he was working at the Fort Detrick. Uh, he quit. Well, eventually I'm just kind of get that. In. When did he it, it become an all in career? You know what I mean? Where he was just all, it was, all I would say probably shit. 1960 is a, is a fair roundabout year to when he was not at Fort Detrick anymore. And, um, he was doing full time fly fishing stuff. And this was before he, um, became, you know, the, he decided to take the job at the Metropolitan Miami Fishing Tournament, which happened in 1964. So between the late 50s and 64 is when he really gained a lot of notoriety. But it was when he went down there and started, you know, seeing all these pioneers in saltwater fly, fly fishing and giving demonstration that he started to make a lot of these connections. That's right. Um, and he would tell me, he would say, you know, that if I hadn't done that if I hadn't taken, you know, Joe Brooks advice and he would gush about Joe Brooks. Yeah. It, you know, just gush about him. Say if, if there was no Joe Brooks, there wouldn't be any me. Huh. Um, so he, you know, went down there in 1964 and then <clears throat> at, at some point the Baltimore sun calls him up. You know, he, he finishes, he, I think he did the, my, the Miami tournament for four or five, maybe even six years. And it's on, and he was writing for Florida Sportsman and and a couple of you know other magazines. So I think he had himself a a pretty good thing going. You know, he would fish and write about it. You know, take the pictures. Um, and at that point in time, I imagine you could make a pretty decent living as a you know a freelance writer. Mm -hmm. um, and he, um, you know, eventually got a call from the Baltimore Sun, which uh, is still being published up here in Maryland. And they wanted him to be their outdoors writer, um, which, you know, I think we have one outdoors writer left here in Maryland. Oh, wow. But anyway, it was a big deal for, for him. And he told me, he said, you know, they, they didn't even make me an offer. I, I told them what exactly I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, how much I wanted to be paid for it. You know, that was the only way I was going to leave Florida because I actually left Florida. And they didn't even... They didn't even, they're like, okay, fine. Hmm. So they, that's when they moved back, um, up here and, um, you know, that kind of turned his fishing into overdrive cause he didn't have to go to work at Fort Detrick. He didn't have a tournament to run, you know, all, I hate to say all he had to do, but he, you know, he, all he had to do was fish and write and take pictures. Yep. And at the same time as this is when he's, you know, starting to do what I call his tinkering. You know, he, you know, the lefties deceiver is obviously a very famous fly of his. And he goes and describes how they used to you know, shovel these these crab shells off the, the loading dock in Crisfield and they couldn't catch any of them. And, you know, they, the flies were always getting fouled. So he came up with the lefties deceiver. <laughs> and, um, you know, then he started doing you know, smallmouth fly tying stuff. 
And then he met, you know, Bob Clouser. And, you know, it's it's just from there, you know, he met um, Ted Jurassic and they put, you know, they collaborated on the T-War Reel. And oh, yeah. it just goes on and on and on and on. And this tinkering of his is pretty admirable, you know. And, and when I would visit him at his house, you would see these gadgets all over the place. You know, I'll never forget the first time I go there. He came down and he said, uh, go check my mailbox. My balls are hanging out. <laughs> and I was like, uh, uh, okay. And I look and there's this string with a rubber ball on the end of it. And I go and there's mail in there. I bring it back. And he goes, put the ball back. He yells down his yard. He goes, put the ball back in the mailbox. And I go, okay. And I go up and hand him the mail. And I go, what's, what's up with the ball? And he says, I have the mailbox tilted just enough that when the mailman opens it, the ball comes rolling out, and I know my mail's there. <laughs> you know, he had these little rubber, you know, clear hose, you know, clear tubing on the chains on the lights in his living room because he got tired of being shocked from walking across oh, the yeah. carpet and then touching those things. You know, he had a fishing bobber on his antenna in his truck so he could see, you know, where his car was in the parking lot. Oh, yeah. So this fidgeting and and tinkering with things are what made him such a great innovator of tackle and flies and knots you know he would just obsess about something until he got it right and and that would range anywhere from you know those clear plastic tubes i just told you about to you know a new knot or using a certain material in a certain way to to tie a fly so that tinkering was really an, an important and he knew that that was what he did with things he said i am always trying to make things better and he goes that's what made me you know able to do some of these neat things and he never took credit for any of them you know you would sit you would sit there and he would just say you know me and my friend ted jurassic put this made this uh yeah. reel together you know bob hughes and i you know collaborated on it on the first flats boat um it just goes on yeah. and on and on and on. And, you know, that's, I think that's another piece of his legacy is that his eagerness to, to make things better and to share them and not keep them to himself are, you know, it's another chunk of what made him such a unique, amazing, not just an angler, but a person. Yeah. Well, and you, and you mentioned that we've been talking about some mentors, you know, Joe Brooks sounds like he was the biggest, uh, one we had, uh, I had actually Joe Brooks was on the podcast. Uh, the Joe Brooks, the nephew um, uh, of J the actual Joe Brooks, did a documentary. Um, I'll put a link to that episode. It was really good. But Joe Brooks has a pretty dark uh, part of his history, uh, did probably a little bit different than uh, Lefty, where um, where Joe found himself living on the streets for part of his life. I'm not sure if Lefty, um, yeah, I'm not even sure what was Lefty. Do you know if he was aware of that that phase? Absolutely. He was. He and he shared it with me. He said, you know, I'll never forget sitting on his couch in his living room, which is where we usually kind of hung out and talked. Um, you know, he said to me, he said, you know, Joe was an alcoholic and he had a really serious drinking problem. And I think his wife's name, Joe Brooks wife's name was Mary. He said when he yeah. met Mary, Mary essentially saved his life. Yep. Um, and that was another, you know, there are just these long lists of things about lefty just the way he described that you know he didn't say you know joe brooks was a drunk and he said you know joe had some problems with alcoholism yeah. you know and he said you know he met mary and mary helped him you know get his life together that's right um so yeah he definitely he was very open about that and he was very open about his his own life you know if he if he got to the point where he felt like he trusted you you know he would describe things of a personal nature that you may not have even wanted to hear, but he'd talk about it. And That's he had right. this, this kind of chortle, this kind of grunt that when he would say something that was semi embarrassing or semi funny, or he wanted to let you know that he, he was joking. He'd kind of go <clears throat> like that. You yeah. know, he'd, he'd kind of grunt like that. And, uh, so anyway, <laughs> but yes, he was very open about Joe Brooks and, and his flaws. And he's always been very open about, you know, other people, you know, he said, he, he told me, he said, Yvonne Chouinard from Patagonia is quiet. You probably won't, he won't talk to you. He goes, that's just the way he is. You know, he said, Tom Brokaw will talk to you when you know, when I was putting this article together. Uh -huh. um, and I don't think any of these people are offended by him.
being flat out honest about about them, you know, um, because he just has this manner of, of saying things in such a way that are not offending and are matter of fact. And, you know, it's it's what made him human. You know, it mm-hmm. was his ability to connect with people in that way. Um, and, and, and it sounds kind of corny, but unless you spend a couple hours with him, at least you don't start to see these little bits. And if you talk to the people who have talked to him or have been yeah. blessed enough to have him in their life, even for a little bit, you know, they're like me. You can just go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, but, uh, hmm. yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah, no, and I, and I've, uh, like I said, I've interviewed a, a number of people over the years that have told some of, uh, lefty stories and, yeah, they're always entertaining. And, you know, some of them are, I think he talked, he talked about one where I think he had to shave down below, you know, something and he, you know, he made it a funny story and (laughs) he messed with the nurse, but you know, and then there's the flip pallet story of the $40,000 or whatever it was. I mean, there's all these stories. Is there any stories? Are there any stories that, you know, you, you've heard, you keep hearing a lot about with lefty that would be something that might be interesting to hear now? Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, actually, probably the best one is he was being flown into. I want to. I don't know if they were in South. I believe they were in South America, and they were going fishing. I think it was. It might have actually been. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was. It was New Guinea, and they wanted to um, fish for this New Guinea bass, which is is kind of like a Kubera snapper. And, uh, you know, he said, that's the hardest fighting fish I've ever, 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 uh, you know, uh, tangled with. And he, the the first part of the story is what's funny and what today would probably offend people. But he said, you know, we flew in, in this plane and he goes, uh, we came in and these people had, you know, plates in their lips and bones in their ears. And, you know, he said they were so ugly, the tide wouldn't take them. (laughs) Right. And what? And he goes, he goes, you know, so that night I'm, I'm working with this guy and we're stringing up this, uh, um, you know, these rods with all this crazy, um, equipment. And he goes, I thought these guys were messing with me. And I go, well, what do you mean you thought they were messing with me? He goes, he goes, Gary, they were winding these things up with like a hundred pound monofilament or, you know, something like that. And I forget the name of the guys, but he, you know, he tells this story. He's like, and I've got these people wandering around with no clothes on, <laughs> You know, these guys are trying to play a joke on me about this fish. And uh, so then he goes on and he's talking about, you know, fishing and and, you know, these fish live in the the roots and you have to kind of get a fly in there and um, to to get them to come out. He says, if you can get them to come out and get them hooked, he goes, "Um, they don't fight long, but it'll be the, you know, the, the craziest 30 seconds of your life. And uh, he told me, this, he said, the drag was so insufficient on the fly reel that I took a pair of pliers and I tightened the drag down so tight that it wouldn't move. And we would, you know, have to basically, you know, hit the outboard and <laughs> drag the fish out from underneath these roots. And he goes, meanwhile, you know, all these natives are watching us and laughing at <laughs> us. Um, but there's he's just got so many stories that are that are, you know, just crazy like that and he did you know it's funny one time i was working with him on his computer and uh you know i'm going through his photos and he's like i need i want to organize this way and and do this this is this time when i was kind of going up there once a month and helping him with the computer and he's trying to help me with my hopeless casting and um so we start going through these pictures and he's a few of them he's half naked in a hospital bed his entire chest is a bruise and he doesn't have any underwear on and you know, most people would be like, Oh, get out of there. Right. And he goes, he goes, Oh yeah. Those are the pictures I wanted to send my grand, my grandkids to, you know, to show. I'm like lefty. You can't share this <laughs> with your grandkids. And he looks at me and goes, why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, I totally get that. That's so funny because we had a, an old guy, Max Cowbrenner was an old, when I was a little kid, um, he was like bigger than life. He was a boxer. He was, 
you know, and he would do this thing on the river. Like we'd all be sitting there in the summertime, the river's ice cold. Uh, and he would just strip down just buck ass naked, get in the river. <laughs> and, and I remember as a kid, you know, he had like, uh, I mean, I, you know, it's a podcast so he could say this, but it's like, you know, it, it was all hanging out. And it was like no big deal, right? No big deal for him. He was just walking in the water and just, you know, it was like no big deal. So I think there's something about the older. I mean, like we've changed probably as a society, that that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Like it shouldn't be wrong, but I think we've maybe it, it is thought of as it is. I don't know. It seems like Lefty's a little like that guy. Hey, totally. And he would say inappropriate things, but then he'd just do that, <clears throat> yeah. you know, like that. And, and you knew – that he knew yeah. that he was put he was pushing the line a little bit. That grunt was a signal that A, I'm making fun of you, don't be mad about it. Or B, I know this is slightly inappropriate. I mean, he told me this story about Bob Hughes, and Bob Hughes wanted to build this flats boat. So Bob said, I'd like to have lunch with you and get your thoughts on, you know, this boat. So Bob Hughes takes him to a strip club in Florida. Huh. And I'll never forget the way Lefty said this. He goes, Gary, I went in there and there all these women were in there and their titties were hanging out. And he goes, there, there were ski jumps everywhere. And I go, what's a ski jump? He goes, that's the way their breasts were shaped, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> ski <laughs> jump. <laughs> and I'm like, why in the hell did you meet Bob Hughes at a strip club? He said, I didn't know where the hell we we're going. He just gave me the address. We didn't have GPS or internet back then. And it's that that matter of fact innocence that is just so refreshing about him. You like, I mean, now you'd think very seriously about talking to someone about yeah. something like that. And he would just say it matter of fact, give it a grunt or two to let you know that he knows it's pushing the line a little bit. And that was, was, was so lovable about him. Yeah. I've heard that. I've, I've heard the grunt, you know, definitely I'll, I'll have to put a, a couple audio clips of the grunt here so we could hear what that. What yeah. That it's just like, like. he'd go, <clears throat> Yeah, like that. <laughs> that, that's about it. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. TurtleBox is the loudest, truly portable, waterproof Bluetooth speaker available. Perfect for a skiff, drift boat, or your craft of choice. The guys at TurtleBox believe in respecting the peace and beauty while on the water, but listening to great tunes before or after can be amazing. I remember our last big river trip this summer, and it was cool to break out the Bluetooth speaker as we listened to some classic music and tried to play along with our guitars. Without a Bluetooth speaker, we would have missed a bunch of amazing opportunities and some good laughs. The features I love most on this one are the quality bulletproof frame, easy to push and lighted buttons, and uh, at home you can add another speaker for uh, stereo. To be honest, I've been using uh, this speaker quite a bit around the home, and the dance party with the kids has been great. Find out why TurtleBox is our go-to speaker and why it is great for the river as well. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash TurtleBox to support a great company, this podcast, and some tunes. And uh, and let's keep, uh, let's keep this podcast going strong and support a great company. Again, head over to wetflyswing.com slash TurtleBox to get started right now. What do you think, you know, I mean, I guess it's hard to speak for Lefty, but you definitely were around him a while. Do you think, um, you know, what do you think he, if he is to look back now, what he'd be most proud of about his kind of career in fly fishing? That's hard to answer because I don't think he would want to be doted over, first yeah. of all. But I think, I think he would probably be most proud of the knowledge that he shared with people and his contributions to the sport of not just fly fishing, but angling in general. Um, he gave so much of himself and I, you know, I had such a small, tiny window of his life. You know, there are people who definitely know him better than I do. And have yeah. definitely spent more time with him. Who are those people that uh, if maybe I know flip pallets, one of them, and Bob Clouds, Tom Brokaw, Oh yeah. You know, Tom, Tom Brokaw's, um, uh, daughter, um, her son is, well, was Lefty's godson. Um, you know, I talked to Tom Brokaw for the interview, which was wildly intimidating. Um, and, you know, he just gushed about about Lefty. How was that? Uh, take a side tangent. I'm just Tom Brokaw, obviously, is a, is a big name. How, how was that for you? How was the interview? Was it? Did it go pretty well? Smooth? Lefty was Lefty was this is just another Lefty story. Lefty, I was like, hey, I'm right. You know, this is when I'm writing the story about him. And I went up there two or three times to interview him and record it. 
And I said, hey, it would be really helpful for me if I could talk to Tom Brokaw, Yvonne Chouinard, and Flip Pallet, and Bob Clouser. And I said, would you please introduce me? I said, because if I try, there's no way I'm ever going to get through. And he did that, and he said, Yvonne is never going to return your emails, calls, or anything, but I'll do it for you anyway. He said, here's Bob's number. Here's, you know, um, I forget the other person I had mentioned, but, you yeah. know, I got, you know, Tom Brokaw emailed me the day after I left. He said he introduced me. And it was <laughs> his email was wild. It was like Coyote One at yeah. UniversalNBC.com. And I'm like, wow, this yeah. is this is getting really interesting. But, yeah, you know, I was sitting here in my office. I was working from home at the time and I still do. But, um, you know, I'm getting ready to call you know, perhaps one of the greatest interviewers and journalists, you know, of yep. all time. And, you know, we scheduled it and I called and I talked to him and he was great, you know, and he just gushed about lefty and he, you know, talked about lefty's signature 20 minute cat naps in the middle of the day oh, yeah. and fishing with him in the Bahamas and, you know, all of his little weird things like the, you know, he did not like vegetables. He didn't like foods that were colored. You know, if he ordered something at a diner, he would order, you know, a burnt Salisbury steak and burnt fries. That was his thing, you know? Oh, wow. Um, heat and meat is what he called that. He, so did, did but, you, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Did you, did you ask Tom any specific questions about himself? About Tom? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Good. I asked him how he got started in fly fishing and he said he was, you know, he was out in, in Montana and I don't know if he was on assignment. It might've even been Idaho. I'd have to look at my notes, but he, you know, wanted to get into fly fishing and he had bought a fly rod and, and a reel and an outfit. And he was, you know, waiting somewhere. I'm not sure exactly. It might have been Grand Teton, somewhere in that area out in the West. Yeah. And he, you know, gets this fly rod and he's casting and this float uh, boat um, comes down the river and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm really going to show, I'm going to show them I know what I'm doing. So he's false casting. And as soon as the boat is about 20 feet in front of him, he does a forward cast and all three lengths of the top of his fly rod go flying off <laughs> into the distance. <laughs> nice. And I thought that was pretty humble, you know, yeah. for, for a guy that, you know, is, is as famous as, as he is. So um, it was yeah. a treat talking to him. But that's the thing about that's another, you know, another another thing about Lefty is he didn't suffer people that were not good people. You know, there's Yvonne Chouinard. There's Tom Brokaw. There's Flip Pallet, you know, and and sure, all of these people are probably flawed in some way, yeah. ways, but they're generally really good, decent, wholehearted people, you know, and um, that's why they love Lefty, because Lefty was kind of like them in a way. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, talk, talking to Tom Brokaw was, was pretty interesting. Did, did you chat with Yvonne as well? No, I never got in touch with him, and, and yeah. I actually called Lefty, and I said, Lefty, I said, I know I'm being a pain in the ass. I said, but will, will you please urge him on? And he goes, Gary, I can't change who he is. Yeah. I'll never forget that. He just said, I can't change who Yvonne is. He doesn't like talking to people. He's yeah. shy. And I said, oh, okay, fine, you know. Yeah. Funny thing is, he's. Uh, I've heard him on one other podcast he was on um I'll put a link in the show notes to that. It was on conservation. I think, I think that might be the trick. You got to get him on something that he's really passionate about at the time. You know, may, maybe I'm just guessing because I would love to. Yeah. I would love to pick his brain as well because Patagonia is obviously a huge, uh, elite, a big time leader in in uh, mm -hmm. what they do. But he just had so many interesting people that he knew. You know, and and from he was never afraid to help uh, a, another writer out. You know, if I needed like I did a profile on Bob Popovics a couple of years ago and I uh, right before Lefty passed away, I said, hey, can you send a note? To, I was probably you know, Lefty probably considered me slightly a pain in the ass. But, <laughs> you know, I'd say, hey, can you send an email to Bob? I want to do a profile. on, And he did. And I, I had a wonderful time with Bob and I wanted to do one on on Clouser. And, you know, that's how I got in touch with Clouser. So Lefty was always willing to help, you know, another writer. Um with a story or, you know, give them advice. I, I think I remember earlier in our conversation talking about how he told me, you know, include photographs with my articles. Yeah. Um, he was just, you know, it's corny sounded, but he was a giver. Yeah. Um, and he would, 
he would give his time to anyone. If they were, you know, genuine and interested in learning, he would give them his time. If they were egotistical and arrogant, um, he'd drop them pretty quick. That's right. You know? What do you, what do you think with Lefty? His, you know, it, it, like non fishings. Do you do know what he was like? If he wasn't fishing, were there other things he was kind of focused on? Other hobbies and things like that? Not what? that I know of. Yeah. He was it was really into photography. Oh yeah. Um, so he had a computer up in his one of the rooms. His house was like a fly fishing museum. Oh. Um, you know he had he had one room that was his office, and he had a computer in there. And all these contraptions, I, I can't even, it, 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 they're almost impossible to describe. It looked like a, uh, you know, a, a puzzle up there. There were just all these things and all these books and all these photographs. And, you know, we'd sit in there and he'd be talking to me and I'd just be looking at all these books and pictures and and magazines and all this stuff. And then if you walk across the hallway, this is the, the, the upper part of his house. He had a, a tying room and where he would, you know, tie knots and he, you could see a, a you know, I guess you call it, I don't know what the technical name is, but it was a device that measured at what poundage a knot would break. Oh, right. And he had all this fly tying stuff in there and flies and hooks. And all. so those are two rooms. And then when you went down into his basement, and this is a very modest house. Yeah. This is a split level house and what you would call probably very, very middle, maybe lower middle class Cockeysville, which is north of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And you go down into his basement and the first time he took me down there, he's got an entire wall full of fly reels, yeah, probably 80 or 90 of them. And then he's got, um, you know, all these fly rods hanging from the ceiling. I mean, the house was a fly fishing museum. Um, and, you know, he left all of that to his kids. And, you know, most of it was unfortunately au auctioned off. Oh, but, really? You know, yeah. Yeah. They had an auction. I remember I was down in, in Harker's when they had the auction one day, and they did it all online. And wow. um, <clears throat> I, I've been meaning to do some digging to find out whether you know the Fly Fishing Museum, tr you know, got some of it. Um, Th that would be a pretty cool thing to have, right? Is the is the uh, you know Lefty's ha not? You know, it's like the Elvis's house, right? I mean, that Lefty's yeah. that big to have like all that where people could. Because I mean, I would love right now to go in there. I mean, I've seen some of your photos, and you have some beautiful photos on that on that article. But yeah, to see that, to see the wall of reels and line and rods, that would be amazing. Yeah. So and yeah, when I was talking to him, he was actually in his decline. So you know, some days he'd cancel on me, which was fine. Some day, I mean, he, he had a, a, I think it was sometime in, um, 2017 or so he was 92. And, you know, a year before this, he was keeping a schedule that would kill you or me. I mean, hmm. I don't know about you, but I've you know done some long business junkets, you know, where I'm away for four or five days, yeah. you know, 12 or 14 hour days. Well, lefty did that his entire life. Hmm. Um, and, uh, it was around 2017 when I really started digging in and doing this article that he had, uh, you know, a series of, of what he called mini strokes and he had, um, you know, surgery to, to unblock his carotid artery. And that's where that picture that I was telling you about was from. That's why his chest was all bruised because they'd oh. opened his chest up to, you know, clean out all these veins. And, um, that's about the time when he started, you know, being honest with people and, you know, would send out, he'd send out an email every now and then and said, Hey, you know, the doctors say that my heart is not working so good and that I need to stay home, which he hated. Um, but he did. Yeah. Um, and then in, in late summer, like 2017, they're like, look, you, you can't leave the house. You got to stay where you are. Hmm. So that's when he started doing a lot of computer projects and things of that sort. Um, and then I think it was in October, 2017, he basically emailed everybody and said, look, I'm retired. Yeah, that's it. Um, I'll, I'm going to be here in the house. I'm going to be, you know, I think the quote was, again, this is another probably, you know, not PC, um, yep. statement, but he says, you know, I have a number of interesting computer projects and I'll be busier than a Syrian bricklayer. This was <laughs> when the, the Syrian civil war was. Oh, right. Raging. Right. So you know, he would make fun of things that were tragic and, and, you know, he'd grunt and, uh, you know, you'd get a laugh out of it. Yeah. And then I think in, uh, November, his, uh, his daughter came and lived with him and, and they put him on oxygen. And then I kind of just, uh, went from yeah. there and I, 
I did try and get up there to see him, but I, it didn't feel, yeah, I didn't feel like doing it because I thought there were probably more important people than me that, that needed lefty's time and wanted to see him before he went. Um, but you know, 90, 92, um, just incredible. And he, he told me a couple of times, I never expected to live this long. So, um, but yeah, I mean, he's, you know, you know, he's part of that, the, you know, quote unquote greatest generation or was part of that, right. that generation. And, you know, when I was getting ready to talk to you today, I kind of read through the article and I'm like, you know, there just aren't, there aren't people like this in our sport anymore. And I'm not, I'm not trashing anybody, but I'm just saying there are some people, but there are not people that touched so many different lives like lefty. Yeah. Um, he's, he'll, there will never be another one of him. You know, the people out that are still out there teaching and doing stuff like Bob Clouser still gives fly time classes. Um, you know, Bob Popovich does talks and things of that sort, but they were all influenced by lefty. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying Bob Popovich or Bob Clouser would have never done anything or taught people anything, Yeah. but lefty was a big influence in that way. You know, he, he encouraged people to share their knowledge and not hold on to it and not have egos and have fun. You know, his one of the things he told me one time was, you know, the fishing is great and it's exciting to catch fish. And but you know what? You don't you remember those things, but you remember the conversations you had with the guys on the boat or at the side of the stream. He goes for me and he goes, I think most people it's about the company. It's about the people and it's about the memories that you take away. So. That's Every right. time I go fishing now, I try to think of that. And I try to, you know, if we're having a bad day and we're not catching fish, you know, I have to kind of, I think a lefty and I say, oh, you know what? I'm out here with my friend Hugh. It's beautiful. It's tough. But, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm going to remember this. Yeah. Um, and he was really big on that. Um, and he shared all of that with all of us. You know, I think he published... 30 books. And I think one that I would probably uh, recommend to anybody listening is my life was this big. So it's kind of a semi autobiographical thing about his life. um, Hmm. But it's definitely worth a read. I mean, all of his books are great. But this one's a personal one, and and uh, anyway, I just I That's thought it great. was great. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you said that. We were thinking the same thing. I, what were um, maybe a few other of the books out there? Maybe if somebody doesn't know much of his stuff. What were some of his other uh, big books he had? Um, you know, there was that one. There's uh, you know, he had one on fly fishing and salt waters. I'm not sure of the exact titles, and I'm not in my library. Oh, not yeah. that I have a library in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I I could um, put a link out. Yeah. I'll put a link out in the show notes. Maybe I'll put the, like the top, uh, maybe I'll put a list of all of lefty's book and, uh, books in the blog post if I can. It would totally be worth it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, just the way he wrote about things are what, you know, uh, let me see. He did a not book. Oh yeah. For Orvis. I remember he did, um, a lot of not books. He did two or three not books. Mm-hmm. He was really into, into that. um, you know, he had my life was this big and, you know, I'm grabbing the book right now because I want to yeah. read what, how he signed it. I fanboyed him one day and he goes to Gary, <laughs> I hope your life is as much fun as mine is. All the best, Lefty Cray. Yeah. You know, there you go. so anyway, that's a that's a great book. That's uh, one good. of my friends, Candy Thompson, who who uh, Lefty helped become the outdoors. I don't want to say he helped her become the outdoor writer, but he supported you know, um, getting her in that position when women were not necessarily known as being outdoor writers. And one of my favorite, uh, quotes from her is lefty craze, the Johnny cash of the fly fishing writers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's awesome. Anyway, there are, there are plenty of books. Uh, If you just, you know, go onto Amazon or go to your library and and type in lefty cray, you'll see dozens and he can make a book about, you know, what many might consider boring knots, just absolutely, um, incredible to read that's cool yeah i'll have to get one of those uh i gotta teach my kids how to tie knots so maybe i'll give them a lefty's book that uh, might be the thing yeah. to do so yeah. okay all right gary well i think i feel pretty good did we uh leave uh, quite a bit on the table i mean you covered i know his whole life uh, anything else you want to give a shout out here on lefty before we head out uh you know it's it's interesting i'm uh, 
just in sitting here talking to you there a couple times, you know, when, when we're talking about things that I just kind of felt choked up and that's unusual mm-hmm. for me. He was just, you know, and I was such an insignificant part of his life. I think I probably maybe spent a total of maybe 12 hours with him his in, entire life. Yeah. And, you know, in that 12 hours, I came away with just so much. And, you know, I think the way I kind of ended it in my in the piece I wrote about him, I said, you know, for my insignificant little part of Lefty's world, I can never really pay, you know, repay him for his generosity. He helped me become a better writer. Mm-hmm. He helped me become unfrustrated with my fly casting. And, you know, in his example, he just made me a better person. And I think everybody that came in contact with him was made better in some way just by coming into contact with him. And I think he would be, he would love that legacy. I think that, uh, he'd be really proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I, that's well said. I, yeah. And I feel the same way. I mean, like I said, I haven't, I never met him, never talked to him. Um, but just through my guests, you know, I've learned and feel like I, you know, I mean, obviously now we know him a little bit. Um, but I even have a, like a little hashtag I've been using, you know, what, what would lefty do, you know, just to make me think, because I hear these stories, like just on the bit, you know, I don't know how well he was on the business side, but you know how he did things the right way. You know, he didn't do anything. Totally. He, didn't, he didn't cut corners. It was like, you know, he taught people how to do things right. And if you treat people right in business or, or life, it's like you're going to win. That's it. Right. And who sends, you know, let's go back even five years. Who sends handwritten thank you notes? Yeah. That's it. Just for something as minor as I was thrilled to go to his house. And all I did was click a couple preference buttons and I fixed his computer and he sent me this gushing you know yeah. thing every now and then he'd spot something i wrote somewhere and i'd get this this trademark blue stationery i'm like holy cow i got another lefty letter and it would say something just as nice as i really enjoyed your accurate and well written piece on whatever just out of the blue yeah um i know and that- it, it just there, there's there's never ever going to be any anybody like him again yeah. and I, I have about four of those letters uh and I open them up every every if I'm having a bad day, I'll go pick those up. I'll shuffle through them, and usually it resets me just fine. That's cool. <laughs> but with, with those letters, were they kind of a like a postcard, or was this like a page of, of a you know how much? Did oh, you write? they were awesome. His stationery, so it was a, a, a mottled blue envelope. It was kind of thank you card size, um, and it had his his address, and it would say Bernard Victor Cray. Um, in the, in the left hand side, he'd handwrite the, or no, he would type, you, oh. it was, you know, courier type on the front. So he'd hand type it. And then on the inside, his letterhead, you know, had his address and, you know, Bernard Lefty Cray. And there was this iridescent embossed tarpon at the top of it. Oh, wow. It was just gorgeous stuff, but he would, he never typed, he typed a couple to me, but most of them were, were handwritten. Yeah. And I imagine he probably sat in that office and had days of the week where that's nothing. He did nothing but that. And he didn't have to do that. I didn't I didn't I would never expect him to write a, a nice note to say that he enjoyed something that, that I wrote. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always consider myself kind of an average OK writer. <laughs> and he would send me these things. and He'd be like, oh, I really enjoyed this. And I'm like, who does this? You know, and it's just another one of those aspects of him that, you know, I. It's funny when you get older, you kind of think about, well, what are people going to think of me when I'm gone? Yeah. And, you know, I just turned 50 last year and I'm not old by any any means, mm-hmm. but I find myself a lot of the time going to that what would Lefty do thing. Yeah. You know, or, you know, what is my legacy going to be? And I want it to be like his. I want people to, to have these stories of me, you know, exhibiting kindness or sharing something with them or – you know, helping people in some way. And so in that way, he was just so completely selfless. You know, he didn't, he didn't care about titles. He didn't care. I mean, the guy fished with Castro, the guy fished with Hemingway, the guy fished with four presidents. Yep. Um, but he didn't care about that, you know? Um, and he didn't care about himself. You know, he didn't think he was that big a deal. He knew he was, but he didn't. And I just think that's such an admirable trait in, in, you know, the, the days we live in of me, me, me. Yeah, I know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just can't say enough about him. He, yeah. He's just he left such an imprint on the world, whether you're an angler, 
or not an angler. And I think, you know, being lucky enough to get to see him and watch how he operated. And, you know, it, like I said, in my, in my feature, I said, you know, he made me a better person. I pause every now and then go, you know, would lefty do it this way? And yeah, gosh, what a legacy, right? Uh, uh, and that's why this podcast is the, why I wanted to do it, you know, because I wanted to, you know, I couldn't have lefty. So you're telling it, you know, letting everybody know who didn't know him, like the person he was. And I think there's probably most people listening now are like, okay, yeah, am I doing this the right way? You know what I mean? Like, I hope that this week they think about when they do do something that they're like, yeah, well, what would Lefty do, right? I'm going to stick with that hashtag. What would, what would Lefty it's a do? Good, it's a good hashtag. And, yeah. you know, the, 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 the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that this guy, I, didn't, I never fished with him, but I, I know people who have, and I have watched tons of videos and this guy was an absolute master at fly casting. He was so – I watched him this one time. He was fishing with uh, one of our guides here on the bay, uh, Kevin Joe's in hands. And I just watched him at the bow, and he had probably 60 or 80 feet of line at his feet. And he made a couple false casts, and it looked like he was dusting. Yeah. You know, it looked like he had a duster in his hand. And I just sat and watched this 80 feet of line just go, you know, piling out of uh, his fly rod with no effort. And, you know, he was just, you know, in addition to being this awesome person, this great guy, he was a master of his craft. You know, yeah. maybe there are some better casters. Maybe there are, you know, but nobody innovated and nobody you know, changed and transformed the sport like he did. I don't think our sport, you know, of fly fishing or angling in general would be the same if we had not had Lefty. Yeah, I think great. that's that's the, the biggest thing to, to kind of leave on. That's great. All right, Gary. Well, hey, I uh, just wanted to check back on you, uh, Angler's uh, anglersjournal.com. Uh, any, uh, any next six months or so, anything new coming out there or anything you have going you want to give a shout out to? Uh, Actually, we've been doing a lot of, uh, uh, or I have been doing a lot of uh, kind of intricate pieces on specific fish species. I'm working oh, on cool. one right now about tarpon. We just did one on Goliath grouper. That was a lot of fun to do. Um, and, you know, there are some other stuffs that we're working on. Um, we had somebody do um interview with one of Norman McLean's uh, children. Um, oh, nice. So, yeah, we've got a lot of lot of neat stuff uh, coming out. So, and you can find that stuff online. Um, but we're we're always happy to uh, to get new subscribers because the book we call it a book more than we call it a magazine because it's it's this heavy stock. Um, yeah. And our readers always tell us, you know, when that thing comes in the mail, I take the magazine, I put it by my chair, and I like some people tell us it's funny they're like I sip on it. Yeah. I, I read one page. And then I stop and yeah. I come back and I read another page. So huh. if, uh, if it sounds, you know, folks out there, if it sounds like your kind of thing, then, uh, sub- you know, being a subscriber really helps us. You know, obviously the magazine sounds like it's worth it. Uh, you know, it's so beautiful, but as far as the online stuff, do you, are you guys producing stuff there? Can you subscribe online as well? Yeah, you can subscribe for our newsletter, which is normally when we announce print content that we've taken and putting put online from the magazine, um, it doesn't cost anything. Um, so you can go to EnglishJournal.com and enjoy stories there. Um, each page has got a, a link to it. I hate to sound so, uh, you know, <laughs> like yeah. I'm trying to sell people something, oh, yeah. but there's a, a subscription link in the upper right hand corner. And that's Perfect. the, that's the easiest way to get it. And Perfect. it's a quarterly. So, oh, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. All right, Gary. Well, uh, anglersjournal.com. If anybody has questions, I'll put a link to, uh, to your email as well. And uh, yeah, just want to thank you for taking the time today and putting together, um, you know, the article as well. I'll, I'll definitely uh, reread that. I mean, I think you've done a great job of highlighting Lefty. And yeah, just want to thank you today for all the time. Oh, absolutely. It was my pleasure. I could probably go on for another hour, but nobody, <laughs> nobody wants that. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered today, just go to webflyswing.com slash 200. 200 episodes without missing a week. It's been a good run so far, and I'm happy that you're here to share this with us. Uh, I'm going to continue uh, producing the content from here on out. The next 200, I'm hopeful, will be even better than the first 200. That's that's the goal. Uh, if you have a chance to reach out to me and, and haven't yet, I'd love to hear from you and hear your story, where you're at, where you're listening from, all the details there. 
Um, we recently ran a survey, which was very helpful. Um, got a good background on some things we can we can do better. If you want to check out that survey, I think it should still be live at wetflyswing.com slash survey. Uh, you can enter some information to help guide the show. Just want to give you a big thank, uh, a big thank you to you for supporting the podcast for all these years. I'm, uh, like I said, ready to double down and uh, and go all in on this thing. So um, appreciate you hanging out here. I guess that's about all we have for the show today. Um, I have a list of books. Uh, I think is going to be over at the blog post. Uh, I'm going to. I think Lefty had. I'm not quite sure. Maybe if somebody could remind me. I think in the 40, maybe 40 books he wrote over the years. So I'm going to try to put a, a list, put that list over there so you can check that out. Um, but if I don't get the list, there should be a link that will take you over there to another spot. I uh, just want to thank you again today for stopping by. I appreciate all the support and hope to maybe see you uh, online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.